um, Angelique? That's not necessary. Okay, I can just talk. Okay, well, um, it's eight. It's nine thirty. I suppose in some places in the world it's eight thirty. It's nine thirty in South Africa, and I'm very excited to be hosting uh, this ASDSA conversation. Our guest today is Dr. Indira Bagalu. I hope I pronounced it fairly well. And we are going to talk. We're going to have a conversation about the relationship between licenses, designations and qualifications. And hopefully, uh, as I speak about it, you say, yeah, I, you know, what is this? And, and let's see, it's, we got 30 minutes, uh, just uh, very briefly, Indira is from uh, Cornerstone Performance Solutions. She has uh, a doctorate uh, and she's really one of the smart ladies. And I think one of the, the people that we should watch uh, uh, in the uh, South African post-school education and training system. And we're very lucky to have her here today. And Dira, welcome and thank you. And um, yeah, I, I think maybe you want to go straight into your presentation or should we start the conversation straight away? <laughs> Great, thank you. Thanks so much, John. And thanks to the Association for Skills Development in South Africa for having me today. I think it's just such a lovely forum to talk about um, you know, matters that are quite topical in South Africa and beyond, and designations, quali uh, qualifications, the lag regulatory licenses, et cetera, are often huge topics for discussion in the HR boardroom and beyond, and even in the business man management committees. Um, so as John mentioned, I am in the education environment. However, my blood is still very much a practitioner in that I have been in the financial sector for, for many years, um, where I had it up, um, you know, business banking in South Africa, private banking in South Africa, et cetera. And it, it's always great to relate the education and the academic landscape into the whole professional integration and what that means. Um, so for me, you know, just having had this opportunity to talk about this topic. Um, has been quite exciting because I'm looking at it from, from the regulatory landscape, from business perspective, from an individual within a corporate environment, or even within, you know, a um, sort of a, a trade environment. And what does, you know, what does this all mean for them? So um, without further ado, I am going to share my presentation. I will uh, actually go off the deal just in the interest of bandwidth if you don't mind John Ooh, and let's yes awesome. let's talk about this very very interesting um, dilemmas which individuals have and I know very often you know skills development facilitators would say but what is the difference and why do we need all of this mm -hmm. um, so perhaps today would give you some context mm -hmm. and let's talk about the concepts let's talk about the NQF framework and how you know, these three uh, these three concepts actually fit into it. And um, we most certainly um, can have a conversation around that because, you know, just as opposed to presenting, I think it would be most beneficial if you are quite interactive, we talk about the matters that are on your mind and, you know, let's, let's um, demystify um, certain perceptions and, 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 and context as such as we go along. Great. So I'm going to switch my video off and let's go straight into the presentation then. Okay. Okay. Go. John, can you see the, the preser? Yes, we can. Excellent. Fabulous. Yes. Yes. Okay. So we're talking about the relationship between regulatory licenses, designations, and qualifications. Just as a matter of interest, when we talk about licensing as such, you know, people often say, so what do I use? Do I use license? Do I use the S in license? Or do I use the C in licensing? Um, so the, in, in the American context, um, license with an S is both a noun and a verb. And that's just in the American context. In all other English countries, um, license with the C is a noun, and license with the S is when you're using it as a verb. 
So I just thought to clarify that because we often, you know, get quite a lot of questions around that. So let's talk about, you know, regulatory licenses and what that actually means. Um, and this is a very, very important um, aspect that we need to remember because South Africa is quite regulated in, um, you know, in, 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 in multiple aspects. So through specialized organizations, accredited boards, and associations that are generally answerable to various national departments. Um, South Africa is, as I said, quite well regulated and mandated in terms of professional services within the licensing framework. And that, in essence, accompanies multiple sectors. So, you know, it would accompany the health sector, governance, safety, and also environmental aspects as well. Um, in, in essence, if we, if we just look at this, you know, this definition in terms of licensing being quite a critical component in the regulatory framework, and it also facilitates an entry point for applicants before they are allowed to conduct business in specialized fields. One needs to also bear in mind that, you know, within specific occupations, there are statutory um, registrations following academic uh, gr uh, graduations, completions of you know, required internships, articles, time and applicable en entrance exams as such. So in essence, if one considers, you know, just to name a few, the engineering field, um, individuals who are law practitioners, medical and specialists, um, for example, your doctors and your nurses, you know, for them to absolutely, you know, obtain a practice number, there is a process that they have to go through, and a regulatory license is most certainly one of them. Uh, we think about, you know, industrial and, mechani uh, and, and mechanical technicians, uh, chartered accountants, you know, in banking and in the insurance environment, the financial sectors, you know, individuals who are represent, who are reps or who act as intermediaries and provide uh, advisory services to clients. In all of those aspects, one needs to consider that the regulatory licenses are fundamentally important because it allows, you know, the conduct of business in a specialized field. So, so Indira, Indira <clears throat> you said this is the conversation that I, we, I think we wanted to talk about. So, so let me ask you the million dollar question. Uh, you know, you mentioned nurses and doctors in the medical sector. Uh, we're in the skills, the uh, learning and development sector. Uh, don't you think it would, it would be, uh, is it a con, do you think it should be a consideration that, for example, skills development facilitators, SDFs should uh, be licensed? Um, I know that's putting you on the spot and it's something we haven't spoken about before, but I'm just trying to get this difference between a license and a qualification. Yes, I mean, I, I think for, you know, for an individual to really be recognized as a professional and a license to practice, absolutely. If we consider the role of, you know, skills development facilitators, it is in essence quite an quite an important role, and they play an advisory role in many aspects, whether they are, you know, in business management meetings, whether they are in exco discussions, they are the advisory uh, arm towards human capital. So it is such an important role that I do believe to an extent it could be underestimated. Yeah, and I, then, I, yeah I, I agree with you. Yeah. And therefore, you know, there is a process and yes, you know, people go through, you know, the process of actually uh, registering as a skills development facilitator. Mm -hmm. However, I, I'm of the opinion that, you know, their license to operate should most certainly be much more regulated. And it gives them that stature, it, give, it amplifies their role, which is so nuanced and it has multiple complexities which I do believe is, you know, for the for the betterment of the individual. And I, and I, Andy, 
<laughs> moment. I, I confess I'm lost um, between the three different uh, elements. So I'm reading that regulatory licenses provide an entry point before they're allowed to conduct business in a specialist field. Which, and the difference between that and a designation seems to be that the designation ha has experience requirements. Correct. So what is the difference then between a regulatory license and a qualification in essence? What is the difference? Okay. So if we look at your regulatory, um, your license, okay, um, it is most certainly a process where it facilitates and it provides that entry point for applicants before they're allowed to conduct business in a specialist field. So let's talk about a regulatory license, for example, and let's talk about the financial industry as we, 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 we look at uh, FISCA, okay? Um, so, so that's the Financial Services Conduct Authority. If you consider any provider who wants to actually operate in the financial services environment, they most certainly are going to require a, regu uh, a regulatory license in order to operate. So that is your license to practice, okay? Can I, can I well, ask for the clarification then? So as I understand it, the license um, awarded by the FSCA is awarded to a business. It is awarded to a business. It can also be awarded to an independent practitioner. So if, for example, you are wanting to um, be an independent financial advisor, for example, you would need that license to practice. Sorry, to, uh, excuse me, badgering with questions, but I'm I'm trying to get a picture of this. So it's very clear to me that um, if you license an individual, you're looking at their particular skill sets. If you license in a business, you're looking at capacity. So it raises questions around: uh, Do they have a management structure? Do they have financial viability, and so on and so forth? Um, it seems to me also that if you're wanting in the financial sector to license as somebody, maybe you're asking that question as well. So it sounds like you look, you're positioning them as a business. I, I tell you, the, the nub of the problem for me is this: by if if we say that academic qualifications provide you with the knowledge that you need to be able to do something, why do we have another structure that provides a license? because they seem to be looking at the same information. Sure, so, so let's look at it, right? So when we think about a regulatory license, you're looking at regulations that are industry specific, okay? And they generally are, are, are based on mandates and specific rules that are placed by various, it could be ministries, it could be, you know, um, government components, it could be professional bodies, et cetera. So, so, so that, that, you know, that, that's something we need to, we need to um, sort of separate in terms of that regulatory license aspect, because those are your regulations, which are industry specific, and you need specific, you need to comply to specific rules in order for you to actually operate and practice within that industry. If I, if I can link it into something that I'm more familiar with. So I, I understand that if, for example, you want to be an assessor, there are two bits that you've got to get. One is you have to have the assessor unit standard or a similar uh, qualification, if you like. And Correct. secondly, you need to have a registration with the uh, body that manages that particular qualification. And then they're going to look then more specifically um, and I'm familiar with the insurance industry. So they'll want to say, well, you can't, uh, you can't assess a short-term insurance qualification unless you have a background in short-term insurance. So, right. and there's a, that's a registration process. So you register with a CETA currently um, as an assessor uh, for one of the legacy qualifications. Is that, is that equivalent to a license? Are we talking the same thing? So, yeah, because that is, so, so, so no. So what you're, going to, what you're going to consider, right? So maybe let me go through the three aspects and let's come back to your question. Okay, sure. 
Okay. So, so your regulatory license in essence is your a license to operate. Okay. Then we look at designations. So when we talk about the designation, we talk about your designations that are basically titles which individuals receive to show their level of excellence in their line of jobs. So some designations can be used internationally and nationally. Um, and most designations actually require additional study after they complete their undergrad qualification. So in essence, when I say that they are, that they you know, do require additional study, in all cases, that additional study for an individual to actually receive a designation has to be authorized or signed off by the designated professional body, okay? So the policy and the criteria for recognizing a professional body and registering a professional designation um, for the purpose of, you know, um, any of, 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 of any designation, um, SACWA in essence has to be part of that mandate to further develop and, and implement, you know, the, the, the actual qualification. So it's also deemed that the recognition of professional bodies will contribute to strengthening social responsiveness, accountability within professionals and promoting that pride in association for that particular profession. So one needs to then think about the fact that when you have a designation, you need to have membership, okay? So let's look at membership. You need to have membership through your regulatory license. You need to have a qualification. You need to have experience and you need to have had competency assessments which then equate to your designations. So your designations highlight the expertise, okay? Your qualifications in essence are the academic qualifications that you receive post um, your secondary school education. So let's get back to the, to, the, to, to the actual question. Let's take, for example, a chartered accountant, okay? So an individual who's studying towards being a chartered accountant, they go through a process where they do either the um, uh, BEC or would they potentially do a BCom accounting. They would then do their CTA, which is equivalent to an honors, okay? Then they have to, they'll go into an environment, okay, that has that, license to, to operate. So they have now, they're part of that process where they have that license to practice. And let's say this individual is going to, as an auditor's article, uh, they, they're going to be doing the articles in auditing, okay? So they go into an environment where the institution has that license to practice in terms of providing that service as an, aud as, as an auditing firm. Um, the individual goes in now with their honors. They would have to write a first a board exam, okay, through the professional body, which is psycho. So they write their first exam, their, their first board exams. As they are creating competencies, so there are a whole lot of competencies that they actually have to be, that has to be signed off before they can become a CA. They have to work in that environment for at least two years in order for them to write their second boards, okay, through SICA, have all of their competency signed off, and then only would they be deemed with that designation as a chartered accountant, okay? So they have to go, they have to be part of all three of these aspects that we're talking about in terms of being part of an institution that has that license to practice, have the designation, okay, through membership, through qualification, through experience, to competency and assessments, and then also fundamentally before they can actually go into any environment that to start off with the qualification. Okay. 
Does that answer your question? Uh, Indira, I think so. Um, I think if Fabulous. we can, time is not on our side. So maybe if you want to just push forward quickly and then uh, we can talk in the next minute or two. Sure. So if we look at a graduate in the workplace, um, and I just spoke about the example now with the CA, so I'm not really going to, you know, to go into much detail, but you can just see the, the process on the right hand side and we use the Institute of Bankers as an example, where, you know, there's an application. So um, there is a registration process, there's a certification process, and then there's maintenance, and one must not forget the importance of maintenance within a designation. And maintenance is in the form of CPD, continuous professional development. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's a very fundamental aspect that one needs to continuously develop professionally in order to maintain that designation. So continuous development. Um, you know, understanding the, 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 the actual landscape in which you are working, being relevant is fundamentally, fundamentally important in terms of maintaining a designation. Okay, so if we look at, in essence, the basic uh, the South African education and training system, we, we have our three frame, frameworks, which is uh, OMALUSI, the QCTO, and the CHE. And then we have SACWA, who, um, who in essence is the uh, South African Qualifications Authority. Umalusi in essence deals with, um, you know, school leavers, so sort of your NQF um, level one to four. And we have about 26,000 public uh, institutions that's actually accredited to, through Umalusi, 5,000 private, and as I said, their exit level is an NQF one to four. Then you have the QCTO, which is the Quality Council for Trade and Occupation. And this sub framework deals with vocational education. Okay, so um, we, we have around 50 TVETs um, and their uh, NQF exit levels are one to eight. And here you would also have multiple private colleges as well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have the, I couldn't actually get the number of private, colli uh, uh, private um, colleges and the quantum of, of that. Um, and then we have the Council of Higher Education. We have 26 public universities and 193 private, and this is your academic institutions. So your exit level, um, your um, sort of exit levels basically is from a level five right through to a level 10. Okay. Um, if we just look at the framework in terms of the QCTO. And Mira, I, I'm, I'm worried that we're running out of time. Um, and I, I want to come back to this issue of license. The, the fundamental difference between a license, a designation and a qualification. I mean, these two slides that you're showing us are all about the qualification. I'm correct, eh? Yes, yes, yeah. very much so. It's your vocational qualifications and your academic qualifications. So, so what I've heard, and, I, and, and really, I'm, and I'm, I'm sort of now disrupting your presentation, but what I've heard, and, and again, it's just because time is not on our side, um, Qualifications, I think we all know, are conferred by uh, one of the quality councils or a provider accredited by a quality. That's a qualification. A designation, um, we have covered that in the recent talk, are conferred by uh, SACWA recognized professional bodies. The, and it's really coming back to the licenses, and you mentioned the FSCA. Uh, as a, a licensing body that gives licenses to individuals to practice. You also mentioned doctors. Uh, one of the questions we got uh, that came in was that uh, it's not only higher education uh, uh, that uh, it applies. Are there, do you, off the top of your head, are there other licenses that don't require, for example, someone to have an underlying degree to get the license to operate in that field. I'm talking about a license as opposed to a designation. Um, 
So, so if you're talking about um, qualification, John, am I understanding you correctly? No. An individual so, needing a qualification in order to. Yeah, so so I'm 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 trying to to take you know we've spoken about the CA and the CA has to have an honours degree, uh, it, yes. and and the license, it's actually an an, an accounting and or auditing a license which would be the license is not because I'm a CA you get a license from Urba, uh, it's a separate license. So in in the accounting world there are three legs, qualification from a university. Uh, designation from uh, the professional body psycho and a license from Urba. Uh, that's as I understand it. Uh, you know, um, are there are there other examples? Maybe um, I don't know uh, that you can think of where a license is required to operate in addition to the underlying qualification. Hmm. No, I. I mean, the one that I, I that comes to my mind is in the real estate sector. Um, you've got, um, you know, you've got to have an underlying qualification, but you also got to go to the the old AAB. Uh, yes. AAB. Uh, you you can't go and sell houses without a license from the EAB. It's that it's that difference that I'm trying to make sure we, uh, uh, you know, the the ASDSA members recognise. And I think that was the question Andy was asking earlier, is, um, you know, if you're going to be an assessor, uh, you have to apply to a CETA to be, you know, given assessor status. Is that a license uh, or is it just some simple rule? I think that is, you know, that is a license to operate. Yeah, yeah. So that I, most certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think there are, there are some professions that we know, like you're a licensed nurse, you know, yeah. you, not, you not only do the qualification, but you have to be, you have to have your, your number, similarly with a doctor, similarly with an engineer. Um, yeah. I, I just, you know. I and that's when you have your practice numbers, right? So yes. in order for you, so when you have a license, you would actually then have that practice number. Yeah. So, so the, and it goes suppose, to yeah. Sorry, John. I suppose that the, the key question here is in our education and training sector, that separate concept of a license, which is as you in your in your I think your second slide, it's that entry requirement uh, to be able to to operate. That uh, should that not should we not consider taking that wider in the in the South African post school education and training system, um, or yeah as a and that's, I suppose, the thought that's going on in my head. And I'd leave it to the panel to actually ask, to, to, to give their thoughts on that, because it's a very yeah. profound question that you're asking. You know, I think someone actually mentioned that it's important to know that qualifications don't have to be academic. Absolutely. So, it, you know, RPL's um, vocational qualifications, and that's the reason why I actually put the framework uh, yeah. out there. Yes. So most certainly, please note that your qualifications are academic and vocational and RPL, and we mustn't even forget the importance of RPL in the process. Yeah. So, so I mean, yeah, to, maybe to summarize, uh, uh, skills development uh, practitioners that are advising their clients, and they could be in the, in the it's called it the technical or the uh, commercial space. Uh, the, I think the point that this, this top this conversation was to bring home is when we do our workplace skills plans and our annual training reports, but mostly the planning side. Uh, it's to think not only about the, the qualifications and the part qualifications, but then also to think about the development of employees to achieve designations. And then the the third leg, and that you know well in the financial services space, and that's why we got you to talk to us is in the financial services space, you also have to comply with licensing requirements. And all of them are about building your knowledge, skills, and competency. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And I just want to go back to what Andy asked, right? In the yeah, sense sure. that licenses could be managed by professional bodies. Um, 
sees an overlap in terms of the functions of licensing bodies and professional bodies, and do we really need them both? We absolutely need them both because they're two very, very distinct rationales, rationale for licensing, okay? Because your licensing is actually your entry point. That's before you, you get the experience, et cetera. That is your license to practice. So we spoke about a doctor, we spoke about a nurse. You need that license to practice. As a bank, as a financial institution, you need a license in order to practice, okay? Your designation is not your professional body is not necessarily the person who would issue the license because your license is not necessarily only around designations. Remember, it has a whole lot of other variations and variable rules in terms of operating within that industry that is fundamental. Okay, and your designation to a large extent is really giving your qualification and that professional certification the esteem that is required. So one needs to really understand the difference between licensing and designations. Okay, Dira, thank you very much. You won't believe it, but our half an hour is already up. <laughs> you know, it's amazing how quickly, uh, you know, 30 minutes goes when you're having a conversation like this. I, I want to say thank you very much. Um, you tackled a, a very tough subject uh, and, um, and in a very short time. I think the important thing is we've, we've left our members, I really do hope, with, with uh, raised awareness of the difference between the specific, the, oh, the license, the designation and the qualification. And, and that was what we hope to do. Um, yeah, and maybe we'll get you back at a, at a future conversation so we can take this conversation a bit further. Sure. So thank you, Absolutely. Indira. And maybe we should look at each aspect because, you know, it's just, yeah. there, there's just so much to talk about. And I think uh, sort of 30 minutes to your point just gives sort of an overview and food yeah. for thought. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And uh, thanks, thanks to everybody for joining us. And uh, don't forget to claim your CPD points. And Indira, once again, thank you very much. And uh, yes, that's the session over for this week. Okay, have a good day, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Cheers, eh? Bye then. Bye.